Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. John Silence, Case 1, A Psychical Invasion by Algernon Blackwood And what is it makes you think I could be of use in this particular case? asked Dr. John Silence, looking across somewhat skeptically at the Swedish lady in the chair facing him. Your sympathetic heart and your knowledge of occultism. Oh, please, that dreadful word, he interrupted, holding up a finger with a gesture of impatience. Well, then, she laughed. Your wonderful clairvoyant gift and your trained psychic knowledge of the processes by which a personality may be disintegrated and destroyed. These strange studies you've been experimenting with all these years. If it's only a case of multiple personality, I must really cry off, interrupted the doctor again hastily, a bored expression in his eyes. It's not that. Now please be serious, for I want your help, she said. And if I choose my words poorly, you must be patient with my ignorance. The case I know will interest you, and no one else could deal with it so well. In fact, no ordinary professional man could deal with it at all. For I know of no treatment or medicine that can restore a lost sense of humor. You begin to interest me with your case, he replied, and made himself comfortable to listen. Mrs. Stevenson to a sigh of contentment as she watched him go to the tube and heard him tell the servant he was not to be disturbed. I believe you have read my thoughts already, she said. Your intuitive knowledge of what goes on in other people's minds is positively uncanny. Her friend shook his head and smiled as he drew his chair up to a convenient position and prepared to listen attentively to what she had to say. He closed his eyes, as he always did when he wished to absorb the real meaning of a recital that might be inadequately expressed, for by this method he found it easier to set himself in tune with the living thoughts that lay behind the broken words. By his friends, John Silence was regarded as an eccentric, because he was rich by accident and by choice, a doctor, that a man of independent means should devote his time to doctoring, chiefly doctoring folk who could not pay, past their comprehension entirely. The native nobility of a soul whose first desire was to help those who could not help themselves puzzled them. After that, it irritated them, and greatly to his own satisfaction they left him to his own devices. Dr. Silence was a freelance, though, among doctors, having neither consulting room, bookkeeper, nor professional manner. He took no fees, being at heart a genuine philanthropist, yet at the same time did no harm to his fellow practitioners, because he only accepted unremunerative cases, and cases that interested him for some very special reason. He argued that the rich could pay and the very poor could avail themselves of organized charity, but that a very large class of ill-paid, self-respecting workers, often followers of the arts, could not afford the price of a week's comfort merely to be told to travel, and it was these he desired to help, cases often requiring special and patient study, things no doctor can give for a guinea, and that no one would dream of expecting him to give. But there was another side to his personality and practice, and one with which we are now more directly concerned, for the cases that especially appealed to him were of no ordinary kind, but rather of that intangible, elusive, and difficult nature best described as psychical afflictions, and though he would have been the last person himself to approve of the title, it was beyond question that he was known more or less generally as the psychic doctor. In order to grapple with cases of this peculiar kind, he had submitted himself to a long and severe training, at once physical, mental, and spiritual. What precisely this training had been, or where undergone, no one seemed to know, for he never spoke of it, as indeed he betrayed no single other characteristic of the charlatan, but the fact that it had involved a total disappearance from the world for five years, and that after he returned and began his singular practice, no one ever dreamed of applying to him 
the so easily acquired appetite of quack spoke much for the seriousness of his strange quest and also for the genuineness of his attainments for the modern psychical researcher he felt the calm tolerance of the man who knows there was a trace of pity in his voice contempt he never showed when he spoke of their methods this classification of results is uninspired work at best he said at once to me when i had been his confidential assistant for some years it leads nowhere and after a hundred years will lead nowhere it is playing with the wrong end or rather dangerous toy far better it would be to examine the causes and then the results would so easily slip into place and explain themselves for the sources are accessible and open to all who have the courage to lead the life that alone makes practical investigation safe and possible and towards the question of clairvoyance too his attitude was significantly sane for he knew how extremely rare the genuine power was and that what is commonly called clairvoyance is nothing more than a keen power of visualizing it connotes a slightly increased sensibility nothing more he would say the true clairvoyant deplores his power recognizing that it adds a new horror to life and is in the nature of an affliction and you will find this always to be the real test thus it was that john silence this singularly developed doctor was able to select his cases with a clear knowledge of the difference between mere hysterical delusion and the kind of psychical affliction that claimed his special powers it was never necessary for him to resort to the cheap mysteries of divination for as i have heard him observe after the solution of some peculiarly intricate problem systems of divination from geomancy down to reading by tea leaves are merely so many methods of obscuring the outer vision in order that the inner vision may become open once the method is mastered no system is necessary at all and the words were significant of the methods of this remarkable man the keynote of whose power lay perhaps more than anything else in the knowledge first that thought can act at a distance and secondly that thought is dynamic and can accomplish material results learn how to think he would have expressed and you have learned to tap power at its source to look at he was now past forty he was sparely built with speaking brown eyes in which shone the light of knowledge and self-confidence while at the same time they made one think of that wondrous gentleness seen most often in the eyes of animals a close beard concealed the mouth without disguising the grim determination of lips and jaws and the face somehow conveyed an impression of transparency almost of light so delicately were the features refined away on the fine forehead was that indefinable touch of peace that comes from identifying the mind with what is permanent in the soul and letting the impermanent slip by without power to wound or distress while from his manner so gentle quiet sympathetic if you could have guessed the strength of purpose that burned within like a great flame i think i would describe it as a psychical case continued the swedish lady obviously trying to explain herself very intelligently and just the kind you like i mean a case where the cause is hidden deep down in some spiritual distress and but the symptoms first please my dear svenska he interrupted with a strangely compelling seriousness of manner and your deductions afterwards she turned around sharply on the edge of her chair and looked him in the face lowering her voice to prevent her emotion betraying itself too obviously in my opinion there's only one symptom she half whispered as though telling something disagreeable fear simply fear physical fear i think not though how can i say i think it's a horror in a psychical region it's no ordinary delusion the man is quite sane but he lives in mortal terror of something i don't know what you mean by his psychical regions said the doctor with a smile but i suppose you wish me to understand that his spiritual and not his mental processes are affected anyhow try and tell me briefly and pointedly what you know about the man his symptoms his need for help my peculiar help that is and all that seems vital in the case i promise to listen devotedly i'm trying she continued earnestly but must do so in my own words and trust to your intelligence to disentangle as i go along he is a young author and lives in a tiny house off putney heath somewhere he writes humorous stories quite a genre of his own pender you must have heard of him felix pender 
Oh, the man has a great gift, and married on the strength of it. His future seemed assured. I say had, for quite suddenly his talent utterly failed him. Worse, it became transformed into its opposite. He can no longer write a line in the old way that was bringing him success. Dr. Silence opened his eyes for a second and looked at her. He still writes then? The force has not gone? He asked briefly and then closed his eyes again to listen. He works like a fury, she went on, but produces nothing. She hesitated a moment. Nothing that he can use or sell. His earnings have practically ceased and he makes a precarious living by book reviewing and odd jobs. Very odd, some of them. Yet I am certain his talent has not really deserted him finally, but is merely... Again, Mrs. Sevenson hesitated for the appropriate word. In abeyance, he suggested, without opening his eyes. Obliterated. She went on after a moment to weigh the word, merely obliterated, by something else. By someone else? I wish I knew. All I can say is that he is haunted, and temporarily his sense of humor is shrouded. Gone, replaced by something dreadful that writes other things. Unless something competent is done, he will simply starve to death. Yet he's afraid to go to a doctor for fear of being pronounced insane. And anyhow, a man can hardly ask a doctor to take a guinea to restore a vanished sense of humor, can he? Has he tried anyone at all? Not doctors yet. He tried some clergymen and religious people, but they know so little and have so little intelligence, sympathy, and most of them are so busy balancing under little pedestals. John Silence stopped her tired with a gesture. And how is it that you know so much about him? He asked gently. I know Mrs. Pender well. I knew her before she married him. And is she a cause, perhaps? Not in the least. She is devoted, a woman very well educated, though without being really intelligent and with so little sense of humor herself that she always laughs at the wrong places. But she has nothing to do with the cause of his distress, and indeed has chiefly guessed it from observing him, rather than from what little he has told her. And he, you know, is a really lovable fellow, hard-working, patient, altogether worth saving. Dr. Silence opened his eyes and went over to ring for tea. He did not know very much more about the case of the humorous than when he first sat down to listen, but he realized that no amount of words from his Swedish friend would help to reveal the real facts. A personal interview with the author himself could alone do that. All humorists are worth saving, he said, with a smile as she poured out tea. We can't afford to lose a single one in these strenuous days. I will go and see your friend at the first opportunity. She thanked him elaborately, effusively, with many words, and he, with much difficulty, kept the conversation thenceforward strictly to the teapot. And as a result of this conversation, and a little more he had gathered by means best known to himself and his secretary, he was whizzing in his motor car one afternoon a few days later up the Putney Hill to have his first interview with Felix Pender, the humorous writer who was the victim of some mysterious malady in his psychical region that had obliterated his sense of the comic and threatened to wreck his life and destroy his talent, and his desire to help was probably of equal strength with his desire to know and to investigate. The motor stopped with a deep purring sound, as though a great black panther lay concealed within its hood, and the doctor, the psychic doctor, as he was sometimes called, stepped out through the gathering fog and walked across the tiny garden that held a blackened fir tree in a stunted laurel shrubbery. The house was very small, and it was some time before anyone answered the bell. Then suddenly a light appeared in the hall, and he saw a pretty little woman standing on the top step, begging him to come in. She was dressed in gray, and the gaslight fell on a mass of deliberately brushed light hair. Stuffed dusty birds and a shabby array of African spears hung on the wall behind her. A hat rack with a bronze plate full of very large cards led his eyes swiftly to a dark staircase beyond. Mrs. Pender had round eyes like a child's, and she greeted him with an effusiveness that barely concealed her emotion, yet strove to appear naturally cordial. Evidently, she had been looking out for his arrival, and had outrun the servant girl. She was a little breathless. "'I hope you've not been kept waiting. I think it's most good of you to come,' she began, and then stopped sharp when she saw his face in the gaslight. There was something in Dr. Silence's look that did not encourage mere talk. 
He was in earnest now, if ever man was. "'Good evening, Mrs. Pender,' he said, with a quiet smile that won confidence, yet deprecated unnecessary words. "'The fog delayed me a little. I am glad to see you.' They went into a dingy sitting-room at the back of the house. Neatly furnished but depressing, books stood in a row upon the mantelpiece. The fire had evidently just been lit. It smoked in great puffs into the room. Mrs. Silvenson said she thought you might be able to come, ventured the little woman again, looking up engagingly into his face and betraying anxiety and eagerness in every gesture. But I hardly dared to believe it. I think it is really too good of you. My husband's case is so peculiar that, well, you know, I'm quite sure any ordinary doctor would say at once the asylum. Isn't he in, then? asked Dr. Silence gently. In the asylum? she gasped. Oh, dear, no, not yet. "'In the house, I meant,' he laughed. "'She gave a great sigh. "'He'll be back any minute now,' she replied, "'obviously relieved to see him laugh. "'But the fact is, we didn't expect you so early. "'I mean, my husband hardly thought you would come at all. "'I'm always delighted to come, "'when I'm really wanted and can be of help,' he said quickly. "'And perhaps it's all for the best that your husband is out. "'For now that we are alone, "'you can tell me something about his difficulties. "'So far as you know, I have heard very little.' Her voice trembled as she thanked him, and when he came and took a chair close beside her, she actually had difficulty in finding words with which to begin. In the first place, she began timidly, and then continuing with a nervous, incoherent rush of words, he will be simply delighted that you've really come, because he said you were the only person he would consent to see at all, the only doctor. I mean, but of course he doesn't know how frightened I am, or how much I've noticed. He pretends with me that it's just a nervous breakdown, and I'm sure he doesn't realize all the odd things I've noticed him doing. But the main thing, I suppose, yes, the main thing, Mrs. Pender, he said encouragingly, noticing her hesitation, is that he thinks we are not alone in the house. That's the chief thing. Tell me more facts, just facts. It began last summer, when I came back from Ireland. He had been here alone for six weeks, and I thought him looking tired and queer ragged and scattered about the face, if you know what I mean, and his manner worn out. He said he had been writing hard, but his inspiration had somehow failed him, and he was dissatisfied with his work. His sense of humor was leaving him, or changing into something else, he said. There was something in the house, he declared, that, she emphasized the word, prevented his feeling funny. Something in the house that prevented his feeling funny, repeated the doctor. Ah, now we're getting to the heart of it. Yes, she resumed vaguely. That's what he kept saying. And what was it he did that you thought strange, he asked sympathetically. Be brief, or he may be here before you finish. Very small things, but significant, it seemed to me. He changed his workroom from the library, as we call it, to the little sitting room. He said all his characters became wrong and terrible in the library. They altered so that he felt like writing tragedies, vile, debased tragedies. The tragedies of broken souls. But now he says the same of the smoking room, and he's gone back to the library. Ah, you see, there's so little I can tell you, she went on with increasing speed and countless gestures. I mean, it's only very small things he does and says that are queer. What frightens me is that he assumes there's someone else in the house all the time, someone I never see. He does not actually say so, but on the stairs I've seen him standing aside to let someone pass. I've seen him open a door to let someone in or out, and often in our bedroom he puts chairs about as though for someone else to sit on. Oh, oh yes, and once or twice, she cried, once or twice, she paused and looked about her with a startled air. Yes? Once or twice, she resumed hurriedly as though she heard a sound that alarmed her. I've heard him running, coming in and out of the rooms breathless as if something were after him the door opened while well, she was still speaking cutting her words off in the middle and a man came in to the room he was dark and clean-shaven sallow rather with the eyes of imagination and dark hair growing scantily about the temples he was dressed in a shabby tweed suit and wore an untidy flannel collar at the neck the dominant expression of his face was startled hunted an expression that might any moment leap into the dreadful stare of terror and announce a total loss of self-control. The moment he saw his visitor, his smile spread over his worn features, and he advanced to shake hands. I hoped you would come, 
Mrs. Sevenson said you might be able to find time. He said simply, his voice was thin and reedy, I am very glad to see you, Dr. Silence. It is doctor, is it not? Well, I am entitled to the description, laughed the other, but I rarely get it. You know, I do not practice as a regular thing, that is, I only take cases that specifically interest me or... He did not finish the sentence, for the man exchanged a glance of sympathy that rendered it unnecessary. I have heard of your great kindness. It's my hobby, said the other quickly, and my privilege. I trust you will still think so when you have heard what I have to tell you, continued the author, a little wearily. He led the way across the hall into the little smoking room where they could talk freely and undisturbed. In the smoking room, the door shut and privacy about them. Pender's attitude changed somewhat, and his manner became very grave. The doctor sat opposite, where he could watch his face. Already he saw it looked more haggard. Evidently it cost him much to refer to his trouble at all. What I have is, in my belief, a profound spiritual affliction, he began quite bluntly, looking straight into the other's eyes. I saw that at once, Dr. Silence said. Yes. You saw that, of course. My atmosphere must convey that much to anyone with psychic perceptions, besides which I feel sure, from all I've heard, that you are really a soul doctor, are you not, more than a healer merely of the body? You think of me too highly, returned the other, but I prefer cases, as you know, in which the spirit is disturbed first, the body afterwards. I understand, yes, well, I have experienced a curious disturbance in not in my physical region primarily i mean my nerves are all right and my body's all right i have no delusions exactly but my spirit is tortured by a calamitous fear which first came upon me in a strange manner john silence leaned forward a moment and took the speaker's hand and held it in his own for a few brief seconds closing his eyes as he did so he was not feeling his pulse or doing any of the things that doctors ordinarily do he was merely absorbing into himself the main note of the man's mental condition, so as to get completely his own point of view, and thus be able to treat his case with true sympathy. A very close observer might perhaps have noticed that a slight tremor ran through his frame after he had held the hand for a few seconds. "'Tell me quite frankly, Mr. Pender,' he said soothingly, releasing the hand or with deep attention in his manner, "'tell me all the steps that led to the beginning of this invasion.' I mean, tell me what the particular drug was, and why you took it, and how it affected you. Then you know it began with a drug, cried the author, undisguised astonishment. I only know from what I observed in you, and its effect upon myself. You are in a surprising psychical condition. Certain portions of your atmosphere are vibrating at a far greater rate than others. This is the effect of a drug, but of no ordinary drug. Allow me to finish, please. If the higher rate of vibration spreads all over, you will become, of course, permanently cognizant of a much larger world than the one you know normally. If, on the other hand, the rapid portion seeks back to the usual rate, you will lose these occasional increased perceptions you now have. You amaze me, exclaimed the author, for your words exactly describe what I have been feeling. I mention this only in passing, and to give you confidence before you approach the account of your real affliction, continued the doctor. Our perception, as you know, is the result of vibrations, and clairvoyance simply means becoming sensitive to an increased scale of vibrations. The awakening of the inner senses we hear so much about means no more than that. Your partial clairvoyance is easily explained. The only thing that puzzles me is how you manage to procure the drug, for it is not easy to get in pure form and no alterated tincture could have given you the terrific impetus I see you have acquired. But please proceed now and tell me your story in your own way. This cannabis indica, the author went on, came into my possession last autumn while my wife was away. I need not explain how I got it, for that has no importance, but it was the genuine fluid extract, and I could not resist the temptation to make an experiment. One of its effects, as you know, is to induce torrential laughter. Yes, sometimes. I am a writer of humorous tales, and I wish to increase my own sense of laughter, to see the ludicrous from the abnormal point of view. I wish to study a bit, if possible, and... Tell me. I took an experimental dose. 
I starved for six hours to hasten the effect, locked myself into this room and gave orders not to be disturbed. Then I swallowed the stuff and waited. And the effect? I waited one hour, two, three, four, five hours. Nothing happened. No laughter came, but only a great weariness instead. Nothing in the room or in my thoughts came within a hundred miles of a humorous aspect. Always a most uncertain drug, interrupted the doctor. We make very small use of it on that account. At two o'clock in the morning, I felt so hungry and tired that I decided to give up the experiment and wait no longer. I drank some milk and went upstairs to bed. I felt flat and disappointed. I fell asleep at once and must have slept for about an hour, when I awoke suddenly with a great noise in my ears. It was a noise of my own laughter. I was simply shaking with merriment. At first I was bewildered and thought I had been laughing in dreams, but a moment later remembered the drug and was delighted to think that after all I had gotten an effect. It had been working all along, only I had miscalculated the time. The only unpleasant thing, then, was an odd feeling that I had not waked naturally, but had been awakened by someone else, deliberately. This came to me as a certainty in the middle of my noisy laughter and distressed me. Any impression who it could have been? asked the doctor, now listening, with close attention to every word, very much on the alert. Pender hesitated and tried to smile. He brushed his hair from his forehead with a nervous gesture. You must tell me all your impressions, even your fancies. They are quite as important as your certainties. I had a vague idea that it was someone connected with my forgotten dream, someone who had been at me in my sleep, someone of great strength and great ability, of great force, quite an unusual personality, and I was certain, too, a woman. A good woman? asked John Silence quietly. Pender started a little at the question, and his sallow face flushed. It seemed to surprise him, but he shook his head quickly, with an indefinable look of horror. Evil, he answered briefly. Appallingly evil, and yet mingled with the sheer wickedness of it was also a certain perverseness, the perversity of the unbalanced mind. He hesitated a moment, and looked up sharply at his interlocutor. A shade of suspicion showed itself in his eyes. No, laughed the doctor. You need not fear that I'm merely humoring you or think you mad. Far from it. Your story interests me exceedingly, and you furnish me unconsciously with a number of clues as you tell it. You see, I possess some knowledge of my own as to these psychic byways. I was shaken with such violent laughter, continued the narrator, reassured in a moment, though with no clear idea what was amusing me, that I had the greatest difficulty in getting up for the matches and was afraid I should frighten the servants if they overheard my explosions. When the gas was lit, I found the room empty, of course, and the door locked as usual. Then I half-dressed and went out on the landing, my hilarity better under control, and proceeded to go downstairs. I wished to record my sensations. I stuffed a handkerchief into my mouth so as not to scream aloud and communicate my hysterics to the entire household. And the presence of this, this, it was hanging about me all the time, said Pender. But for the moment it seemed that I withdrawn. Probably, too, my laughter killed all other emotions. And how long did you take getting downstairs? I was just coming to that. I see you know all my symptoms in advance, as it were, for of course I thought I should never get to the bottom. Each step seemed to take five minutes, and crossing the narrow hall at the foot of the stairs. Well, I could have sworn it was half an hour's journey, had not my watch certified that it was a few seconds. Yet I walked fast and tried to push on. It was no good. I walked apparently without advancing, and at that rate it would have taken me a week to get down Putney Hill. An experimental dose radically alters the scale of time and space sometimes. But when at last I got into my study and lit the gas, the change came horridly and suddenly as a flash of lightning. It was like a douche of icy water, and in the middle of the storm of laughter. Yes, what? asked the doctor, leaning forward and peering into his eyes. I was overwhelmed with terror, said Pender, lowering his reedy voice at the mere recollection of it. He paused a moment and mopped his forehead. The scared, hunted look in his eyes now dominated the whole face, yet all the time the corners of his mouth hinted of possible laughter, as though the recollection of that merriment still amused him. The combination of fear and laughter in his face was very curious 
and lent great conviction to his story. It also lent a bizarre expression of horror to his gestures. Terror, was it, repeated the doctor soothingly. Yes, terror. For though the thing that woke me seemed to have gone, the memory of it still frightened me, and I collapsed into a chair. Then I locked the door and tried to reason with myself. But the drug made my movement so prolonged that it took me five minutes to reach the door, and another five to get back to the chair again. The laughter, too, kept bubbling up inside me, great wholesome laughter that shook me like gusts of wind, so that even my terror almost made me laugh. Oh, but I may tell you, Dr. Silence, it was altogether vile, that mixture of fear and laughter altogether vile. Then all at once the things in the room again presented their funny side to me and set me off, laughing more furiously than ever. The bookcase was ludicrous, the armchair a perfect clown, the way the clock looked at me on the mantelpiece too comic for words. The arrangement of papers and inkstand on the desk tickled me till I roared and shook and held my sides, and a tear streamed down my cheek. And that footstool, oh, that absurd footstool! He lay back in his chair, laughing to himself and holding up his hands at the thought of it, and at the sight of him Dr. Silence laughed too. "'Go on, please,' he said. "'I quite understand. I know something myself of the hashish laughter.' The author pulled himself together and resumed, his face growing quickly grave again. So you see, side by side with this extravagant, apparently causeless merriment, there was also an extravagant, apparently causeless terror. The drug produced the laughter, I knew, but what brought in the terror I could not imagine. Everywhere behind the fun lay the fear. It was terror masked by cap and bells, and I became the playground for two opposing motions, armed and fighting to the death. Gradually then the impression grew in me that this fear was caused by the invasion, so you called it just now, of the person who had wakened me. She was utterly evil, inimical to my soul, or at least to all in me that wished for good. There I stood, sweating and trembling, laughing at everything in the room, yet all the while with this white terror mastering my heart, and this creature was putting, putting her. He hesitated again, using his handkerchief freely. Putting what? Putting ideas into my mind, he went on, glancing nervously about the room, actually tapping my thought stream so as to switch off the usual current and inject her own. How mad that sounds. I know it, but it's true. It's the only way I can express it. Moreover, while the operation terrified me, the skill with which it was accomplished filled me afresh with laughter at the clumsiness of men by comparison. Our ignorant, bungling methods of teaching the mind of others, of inculcating ideas, and so on, overwhelming with laughter when I understood the superior and diabolical method, and my laughter seemed hollow and ghastly, and the ideas of evil and tragedy trod close upon the heels of the comet. Oh, doctor, I tell you again, it was unnerving. John Silence sat with his head thrust forward to catch every word of the story which the other continued to pour out in nervous, jerky sentences and lowered voice. You saw nothing? No one. All this time, he asked. Not with my eyes. There was no visual hallucination, but in my mind there began to grow the vivid picture of a woman, large, dark skin with white teeth and masculine features, and one eye, the left so drooping as to appear almost closed. Oh, such a face! A face you would recognize again? Pender laughed dreadfully. I wish I could forget it, he whispered. I only wish I could forget it. Then he sat forward in his chair suddenly and grasped the doctor's hand with an emotional gesture. I must tell you how grateful I am for your patience and sympathy, he cried with a tremor in his voice, and that you do not think me mad. I have told no one else a quarter of all this, and the mere freedom of speech, the relief of sharing my affliction with another, has helped me already more than I can possibly say. Dr. Silence pressed his hand and looked steadily into the frightened eyes. His voice was very gentle when he replied. Your case, you know, is very singular, but of absorbing interest to me, he said, for it threatens not your physical existence, but the temple of your psychical existence, the inner life. Your mind would not be permanently affected here and now, in this world, but in the existence after the bodies left behind. You might wake up with your spirit so twisted, so distorted, so befouled that you would be spiritually insane. 
far more radical condition than merely being insane here. There came a strange hush over the room and between the two men, sitting there facing one another. Do you really mean... Good Lord, stammered the author as soon as he could find his tongue. What I mean in detail will keep till a little later, and I need only say now that I should not have spoken in this way unless I was quite positive of being able to help you. Oh, there's no doubt as to that, believe me. In the first place, I am very familiar with the workings of this extraordinary drug, this drug which has had some chance effect of opening you up to the forces of another region, and in the second, I have a firm belief in the reality of supersensuous occurrences, as well as a considerable knowledge of psychic processes acquired by long and painful experiment. The rest is, or should be, merely sympathetic treatment and practical application. The hashish has partially opened another world to you by increasing your rate of psychical vibration and thus rendering you abnormally sensitive. Ancient forces attached to this house have attacked you. For the moment, I am only puzzled as to their precise nature. For, were they of an ordinary character, I should myself be psychic enough to feel them. Yet I am conscious of feeling nothing as yet. But now please continue, Mr. Pender, and tell me the rest of your wonderful story. And when you have finished, I will tell you about the means of the cure. Pender shifted his chair a little, closer to the friendly doctor, and then went on in the same nervous voice with his narrative. After making some notes of my impression, I finally got upstairs again to bed. It was four o'clock in the morning. I laughed all the way up, at the grotesque banisters, the droll staircase window, the burlesque grouping of the furniture, and the memory of that outrageous footstool in the room below. But nothing more happened to alarm or disturb me, and I woke late in the morning, after a dreamless sleep, none the worse for my experiment except for a slight headache and a coldness of the extremities due to lowered circulation. "'Fear gone, too?' asked the doctor. "'I seem to have forgotten it, or at least ascribed it to mere nervousness. "'Its reality had gone, anyhow, for the time, "'and all that day I wrote and wrote and wrote. "'My sense of laughter seemed wonderfully quickened, "'and my character acted without effort out of the heart of true humor. "'I was exceedingly pleased with this result of my experiment, "'but when the stenographer had taken her departure "'and I came to read over the pages she had typed out, I recalled her sudden glances of surprise. In the odd way she had looked up at me while I was dictating, I was amazed at what I read and could hardly believe I had uttered it. And why? It was so distorted. The words, indeed, were mine, so far as I could remember. But the meaning seemed strange. It frightened me. The sense was so altered. At the very place where my characters were intended to tickle the ribs, only curious emotions of sinister amusement resulted. Dreadful innuendos had managed to creep into the phrases. There was laughter of a kind, but it was bizarre, horrible, distressing, and my attempt at analysis increased my dismay. The story, as it read then, made me shudder, for by virtue of these slight changes it had become somehow to hold the soul of horror, of horror disguised as merriment. The framework of humor was there, if you understand me, but the characters had turned sinister, and their laughter was evil. Can you show me this writing? The author shook his head. I destroyed it, he whispered. But, in the end, though of course much perturbed about it, I persuaded myself that it was due to some after-effect of the drug, a sort of reaction that gave a twist to my mind, and made me read macabre interpretations into words, and situations that did not properly hold them. And, meanwhile, the presence of this person leave you? No that stayed, more or less. When my mind was actively employed, I forgot it. But when idle, dreaming, or doing nothing in particular, there she was beside me, influencing my mind horribly. In what way, precisely, interrupted the doctor? Evil, scheming thoughts came to me, visions of crime, hateful pictures of wickedness, and the kind of bad imagination that so far has been foreign, indeed impossible, to my normal nature. The pressure of the dark powers upon the personality, murmured the doctor, making a quick note. Uh, I didn't quite catch. Pray go on. I'm merely making notes. You shall know their purport fully later. Even when my wife returned, I was still aware of this presence. In the house, it associated itself with my inner personality in most intimate fashion, and outwardly, 
I always felt oddly constrained to be polite and respectful towards it, to open doors, provide chairs, and hold myself carefully differential when it was about. It became very compelling at last, and if I failed in any little particular, I seemed to know that it pursued me about the house, from one room to another, haunting my very soul in its most inmost abode. It certainly became before my wife so far as my attention were concerned. But let me first finish the story of my experimental dose, for I took it again the third night and underwent a very similar experience. Delayed, like the first one in coming, and then carrying me off my feet when it did come with a rush of this false demon laughter. This time, however, there was a reversal of the change scale of space and time. It shortened instead of lengthened, so that I dressed and got downstairs in about twenty seconds, and the couple of hours I stayed and worked in the study passed literally like a period of ten minutes. That is often true of an overdose, interjected the doctor, and you may go a mile in a few minutes, or a few yards in a quarter of an hour. It is quite incomprehensible to those who have never experienced it, and is a curious proof that time and space are merely forms of thought. This time, Pender went on, talking more and more rapidly in his excitement, another extraordinary effect came to me, and I experienced a curious changing of the senses, so that I perceived external things through one large main sense channel, instead of through the five divisions known as sight, smell, touch, and so forth. You will, I know, understand me when I tell you that I heard, sights, and saw sounds. No language can make this comprehensible, of course, and I can only say, for instance, that the striking of the clock I saw as a visible picture in the air before me. I saw the sounds of the tinkling bell, and in precisely the same way I heard the colors in the room, especially the colors of those books in the shelf behind you. Those red bindings I heard in deep sounds, and the yellow covers of the French bindings next to them made a shrill piercing note, not unlike the chattering of starlings. That brown bookcase muttered, and those green curtains opposite kept up a constant sort of rippling sound like the lower notes of a wood horn. But I only was conscious of these sounds when I looked steadily at the different objects, and thought about them. The room, you understand, was not full of a chorus of notes, but when I concentrated my mind upon a color, I heard as well as saw it. That is a known, though rarely obtained, effect of cannabis and dica, observed the doctor. And it provoked laughter again, did it? Only the muttering of the cupboard bookcase made me laugh. It was so like a great animal, trying to get itself noticed, and made me think of a performing bear, which is full of a kind of pathetic humor, you know. But this mingling of the sense produced no confusion in my brain. On the contrary, I was unusually clear-headed and experienced an intensification of consciousness, and felt marvelously alive and keen-minded. Moreover, when I took up a pencil in obedience to an impulse to sketch, a talent not normally mined, I found that I could not draw nothing but heads, nothing in fact but one head, always the same, the head of a dark-skinned woman with huge and terrible features and a very drooping left eye, and so well drawn too, that I was amazed, as you may imagine, at the expression of the face. Pender hesitated a moment for words, casting about with his hands in the air and hunching his shoulders. A perceptible shudder ran over him. What I can only describe as blackness, he replied in a low tone, the face of a dark and evil soul. You destroyed that too, queried the doctor sharply. No, I have kept the drawing, he said with a laugh and rose to get them from a drawer in the writing desk behind him. Here is all that remains of the pictures, you see, he added, pushing a number of loose sheets under the doctor's eyes. Nothing but a few scrawly lines, that's all I've found the next morning. I had really drawn no heads at all, nothing but those lines and blots and wiggles. The pictures were entirely subjective and existed only in my mind, which constructed them out of a few wild strokes of the pen. Like the altered scale of space and time, it was a complete delusion. These all passed, of course, the passing of the drug's effects. But the other thing did not pass. I mean, the presence of that dark soul remained with me. It is still here. It is real. I don't know how I can escape from it. It is attached to the house. Not to you personally. You must leave the house. Yes, only I cannot afford to leave the house. 
for my work is my sole means of support, and, well, you see, since this change I cannot even write. They are horrible, these mirthless tales I now write, with their mockery of laughter, their diabolical suggestion. Horrible. I shall go mad if this continues. He screwed his face up and looked about the room, as though he expected to see some haunting shape. The influence in this house, induced by my experiment, has killed in a flash, in a sudden stroke, the sources of my humor. And though I still go on writing funny tales, I have a certain name, you know. My inspiration has dried up, and much of what I write I have to burn. Yes, doctor, to burn before anyone sees it. As utterly alien to your own mind and personality? Utterly, as though someone else had written it. Ah, and shocking, he passed his hand over his eyes a moment and let the breath escape softly through his teeth. Yet, most admirably clever in the consummate way the vile suggestions are insinuated under cover of a kind of high drollery. My stenographer left me, of course, and I've been afraid to take another. John Silence got up and began to walk about the room. Leisurely, without speaking, he appeared to be examining the pictures on the walls and reading the names of the books lying about. Presently he paused on the hearth rug, with his back to the fire, and turned to look his patient quietly in the eyes. Pender's face was gray and drawn. The hunted expression dominated it. The long recital had told upon him. "'Thank you, Mr. Pender,' he said, a curious glow showing about his fine, quiet face. "'Thank you for the sincerity and frankness of your account. But I think now there is nothing further I need ask you.' He indulged in a long scrutiny of the author's haggard features, drawing purposely the man's eyes to his own, and then meeting them with a look of power and confidence, calculated to inspire even the feeblest soul with courage. And to begin with, he added, smiling pleasantly, let me assure you without delay that you need have no alarm, for you are no more insane or deluded than I myself am. Pender heaved a deep sigh and tried to return the smile. And this is simply a case, so far as I can judge at present, of a very singular psychical invasion, and a very sinister one, too. You perhaps understand what I mean. It's an odd expression. You used it before, you know, said the author wearily, yet eagerly listening to every word of the diagnosis, and deeply touched by the intelligent sympathy which did not at once indicate the lunatic asylum. Possibly, returned the other, and an odd affliction, too, you allowed, yet one not unknown to the nations of antiquity, nor to those moderns, perhaps, who recognized their freedom of action under certain pathogenic conditions between this world and another. And you think, asked Pender hastily, that it is all primarily due to the cannabis? There is nothing radically amiss with myself, nothing incurable or due entirely to the overdose, Dr. Silence replied emphatically, to the drug's direct action upon your psychical being. It rendered you ultra-sensitive. It made you respond to an increased rate of vibration. And let me tell you, Mr. Pender, that your experiment might have had results far more dire. It has brought you in touch with a somewhat singular class of invisible, but of one, I think, chiefly human in character. You might, however, just as easily have been drawn out of human range altogether, and the results of such contingency would have been exceedingly terrible. Indeed, you would not now be here to tell the tale. I need not alarm you on that score, but mention it as a warning you will not misunderstand or underrate after what you have been through. You look puzzled. You do not quite gather what I am driving at, and it is not to be expected that you should, for you, I suppose, are the normal... Christian with the nominal Christian's lofty standard of ethics and his utter ignorance of spiritual possibilities, be a somewhat childish understanding of spiritual wickedness in high places. You probably have no conception of what is possible once you break down the slender gulf that is mercifully fixed between you and that outer world. But my studies and training have taken me far outside these orthodox trips, and I have made experiments that I could scarcely speak to you about in language that would be intelligible to you. He paused a moment to note the breathless interest of Pender's face and manner. Every word he uttered was calculated. He knew exactly the value and effect of the emotion he desired to awaken in the heart of the afflicted being before him. And, from certain knowledge I've gained through various experiences, he continued calmly, I can diagnose your case, as I said before, to be one of psychical invasion. And the nature of this uh, invasion, 
stammered the bewildered writer of humorous tales. There is no reason why I should not say at once that I do not yet quite know, replied Dr. Silence. I may first have to make one or two experiments. On me? gasped Pender, catching his breath. Not exactly, the doctor said, with a grave smile, but with your assistance, perhaps. I shall want to test the conditions of the house, to ascertain, if possible, the character of the forces, of the strange personality that has been haunting you. At present, you have no idea exactly who, what, why, I asked the other, in a wild flurry of interest, dread, and amazement. I have a very good idea, but no proof, rather, returned the doctor. The effects of the drug in altering the scale of time and space, emerging the senses have nothing primarily to do with the invasion. They come to anyone who is fool enough to take an experimental dose. It is the other features of your case that are unusual. You see, you are now in touch with certain violent emotions, desires, purposes, still active in this house, that were produced in the past by some powerful and evil personality that lived here. How long ago? Or why they still persist so forcibly? I cannot positively say. But I should judge that they are merely forces acting automatically with the momentum of their terrific original impetus. Not directed by a living being? A conscious will, you mean? Possibly not but nonetheless dangerous on that account, and more difficult to deal with. I cannot explain to you in a few minutes the nature of such things, for you have not made the studies that would enable you to follow me, but I have reason to believe that on the dissolution at death of a human being, its forces may still persist and continue to act in a blind, unconscious fashion. As a rule, they speedily dissipate themselves, but in the case of a very powerful personality, they may last a long time. And in some cases, of which I incline to think this is one, these forces may coalesce with certain non-human entities, who thus continued their life indefinitely, and increased their strength to an unbelievable degree. If the original personality was evil, the beings attracted to the leftover forces will also be evil. In this case, I think there has been an unusual and dreadful aggrandizement of the thoughts and purposes left behind, long ago by a woman of consummate wickedness, and great personal power of character and intellect. Now, do you begin to see what I am driving at a little? Pender stared fixedly at his companion, plain horror showing in his eyes, but he found nothing to say, and the doctor continued. In your case, predisposed by the action of the drug, you have experienced the rush of these forces in undiluted strength. They wholly obliterate in you the sense of humor, fancy, imagination, all that makes for cheerfulness and hope. They seek, though perhaps automatically, only to oust your own thoughts and establish themselves in their place. You are the victim of a psychical invasion. At the same time, you have become clairvoyant. In the true sense, you are also a clairvoyant victim. Pender mopped his face and sighed. He left his chair and went over to the fireplace to warm himself. You must think me a quack to talk like this. Or a madman, laughed Dr. Silence. But never mind that. I have come to help you, and I can help you if you will do what I tell you. It is very simple. You must leave this house at once. Oh, never mind the difficulties. We will deal with those together. I can place another house at your disposal, or I would like to take the lease here off your hands, and later have it pulled down. Your case interests me greatly, and I mean to see you through, so that you have no anxiety and can drop back into your old groove of work tomorrow. The drug has provided you, and therefore me, with a shortcut to a very interesting experience. I am grateful to you. The author poked the fire vigorously, emotion rising in him like a tide. He glanced towards the door nervously. There is no need to alarm your wife, or to tell her the details of our conversation, pursued the other quietly. Let her know that you will soon be in possession again of your sense of humor, and your health, and explain that I am lending you another house for six months. Meanwhile, I may have the right to use this house for a night or two for my experiment. Is that understood between us? I can only thank you from the bottom of my heart, stammered Pender, unable to find words to express his gratitude. Then he hesitated for a moment, searching the doctor's face anxiously. And your experiment with the house, he said at length. Of the simplest character, my dear Mr. Pender. Although I am myself an artificially trained psychic, and consequently aware of the presence of discarnate entities as a rule, I have so far felt nothing here at all. This makes me sure 
that the forces acting here are of an unusual description. What I propose to do is to make an experiment with a view of drawing out this evil, coaxing it from its lair, so to speak, in order that it may exhaust itself through me, become dissipated forever. I've already been inoculated, he added. I consider myself to be immune. Heavens above, gasped the author, collapsing onto a chair. Hell beneath, might be a more appropriate exclamation, the doctor laughed. But seriously, Mr. Pender, this is what I propose to do with your permission. Of course, of course, cried the other. You have my permission and my best wishes for success. I can see no possible objection, but, but what? I pray to heaven you will not undertake this experiment alone, will you? Oh, dear, no, not alone. You will take a companion with good nerves and reliable in case of disaster, won't you? I shall bring two companions, the doctor said. Oh, that's better. I feel easier, I'm sure. You must have among your acquaintance men who... I shall not think of bringing men, Mr. Pender. The other looked up sharply. No, or women either, or children. I don't understand. Who will you bring, then? Animals, explained the doctor, unable to prevent a smile at his companion's expression of surprise. Two animals, a cat and a dog. Pender stared as if his eyes would drop out upon the floor and then led the way without another word into the adjoining room where his wife was awaiting them for tea. Part 2 A few days later, the humorist and his wife, with minds greatly relieved, moved into a small furnished house placed at their free disposal in another part of London and John's silence, intent upon his approaching experiment, made ready to spend the night in the empty house on the top of Putney Hill. Only two rooms were prepared for occupation, the study on the ground floor and the bedroom immediately above it. All other doors were to be locked and no servant was to be left in the house. The motor had orders to call for him at nine o'clock the following morning. And meanwhile his secretary had instructions to look up the past history associations of the place and learn everything he could concerning the character of former occupants, recent or remote. The animals by whose sensitiveness he intended to test any unusual conditions in the atmosphere of the building, Dr. Silence selected with care and judgment. He believed, and had already made curious experiments to prove it, that animals more often and more truly clairvoyant than human beings. Many of them, he felt convinced, possessed powers of perception far superior to the mere keenness of the senses, common to all dwellers in the wilds where the senses grow especially alert. They had what he termed animal clairvoyance, and from his experiments with horses, dogs, cats, and even birds, he had drawn certain deductions which, however, need not be referred to in detail here. Cats in particular, he believed, were almost continuously conscious of a larger field of vision, too detailed even for a photographic camera and quite beyond the reach of normal human organs. He had further observed that while dogs were usually terrified in the presence of such phenomena, cats on the other hand were soothed and satisfied. They welcomed manifestations as something belonging peculiarly to their own region. He selected his animals, therefore, with wisdom, so that they might afford a differing test, each in its own way, and that one should not merely communicate its own excitement to the other. He took a dog and a cat. The cat he chose, now full-grown, had lived with him since kittenhood, a kittenhood of perplexing sweetness and audacious mischief, wayward it was and fanciful, ever playing its own mysterious games in the corners of the room, jumping at invisible nothings, leaping sideways into the air and falling with tiny moccasin feet onto another part of the carpet, yet with an air of dignified earnestness which showed that the performance was necessary to its own well-being, and not done merely to impress a stupid human audience. In the middle of elaborate washing, it would look up startled as though to stare at the approach of some invisible, cocking its little head sideways and putting out a velvet pad to inspect cautiously. Then it would get absent-minded and stare with equal intentness in another direction, just to confuse the onlookers, and suddenly go on furiously washing its body again, but in quite a new place. Except for a white patch on its breast, it was coal black, and its name was Smoke. Smoke described its temperament as well as its appearance, its movements, its individuality, its posing as a little furry mass of concealed mysteries, its elfin-like elusiveness all combined to justify its name, and a subtle painter might have pictured it as a wisp of floating smoke, 
the fire below betraying itself at two points only, the glowing eyes. All its forces ran to intelligence, secret intelligence, the wordless, incalculable intuition of the cat. It was indeed the cat for the business in hand. The selection of the dog was not so simple, for the doctor owned many, but after much deliberation he chose a collie called Flame from his yellow coat. True, it was a trifle old and stiff in the joints, and even beginning to grow deaf, but on the other hand it was a very particular friend of Smoke's, and had fathered it from kittenhood upward, so that a subtle understanding existed between them. It was this that turned a balance in its favor, this in its courage. Moreover, those good-tempered, it was a terrible fighter, and its anger when provoked by a righteous cause was a fury of fire and irresistible. It had come to him quite young, straight from the shepherd with the air of the hills yet in its nostrils, and was then little more than skin and some bones and teeth. For a collie was sturdily built, its nose blunter than most, its yellow hair stiff rather than silky, and it had full eyes, unlike the slit eyes of its breed. Only its master could touch it, for it ignored strangers and despised their paddings, when any dared to pat it. There was something patriarchal about the old beast. He was in earnest, and went through life with tremendous energy and big things in view, as though he had the reputation of his whole race to uphold, and to watch him fighting against odds was to understand why he was terrible. In his relations with Smoke, he was always absurdly gentle. Also, he was fatherly, and at the same time betrayed a certain diffidence or shyness. He recognized that Smoke called for strong yet respectful management. He recognized that the cat's circuitous methods puzzled him, and his elaborate pretenses perhaps shocked the dog's liking for direct, undisguised action. Yet, while he failed to comprehend these torturous feline mysteries, he was never contemptuous or condescending, and he presided over the safety of his furry black friend, somewhat as a father, loving but intuitive, might superintend the vagaries of a wayward and talented child, and in return Smoke rewarded him with exhibitions of fascinating and audacious mischief and these brief descriptions of their character are necessary for the proper understanding of what subsequently took place. With Smoke sleeping in the folds of his fur coat and the collie lying watchful on the seat opposite, John Silence went down in his motor after dinner on the night of November 15th, and the fog was so dense that they were obliged to travel a quarter of speed the entire way. It was after ten o'clock when he dismissed the motor and entered the dingy little house with the latch-key provided by Pender. He found the hall gas turned low, and a fire in the study. Books and foods had also been placed ready by the servant according to instructions. Coils of fog rushed in after him through the open door, and filled the hall and passage with its cold discomfort. The first thing Dr. Sines did was to lock up smoke in the study with a saucer of milk before the fire, and then make a search of the house with flame. The dog ran cheerfully behind him all the way while he tried the doors of the other rooms to make sure that they were locked. He nosed about into corners and made little excursions on his own account. His manner was expectant. He knew there must be something unusual about the proceeding, because it was contrary to the habits of his whole life, not to be asleep at this hour on the mat in front of the fire. He kept looking up into his master's face, as door after door was tried with an expression of intelligent sympathy, but at the same time a certain air of approval. Yet. Everything his master did was good in his eyes, and he betrayed as little impatience as possible, with all this unnecessary journeying to and fro. If the doctor was pleased to play this sort of game at such an hour of the night, it was surely not for him to object. So he played it too, and was very busy and earnest about it into the bargain. After an uneventful search, they came down again to the study, and here Dr. Science discovered smoke washing his face calmly in front of the fire. The saucer of milk was licked dry and clean. The preliminary examination that cats always make in new surroundings had evidently been satisfactorily concluded. He drew an armchair up to the fire, stirred the coals into a blaze, arranged the table and lamp to satisfaction for reading, and then prepared to watch the animals. He wished to observe them carefully without their being aware of it. Now, in spite of their respective ages, it was the regular custom of these two to play together every night before sleep. Smoke always made the advances beginning with grave impudence to pat the dog's tail, and flame played cumbersomely with condensation. It was his duty rather than pleasure 
He was glad when it was over, and sometimes he was very determined and refused to play at all. And this night was one of the occasions on which he was firm. The doctor looked cautiously over the top of his book, watched the cat begin the performance. It started by gazing with an innocent expression at the dog, where he lay, with nose on paws and eyes wide open in the middle of the floor. Then it got up and made as though it meant to walk to the door, going deliberately and very softly. Flame's eyes followed it until it was beyond the range of sight, and then the cat turned sharply and began patting his tail intentively with one paw. The tail moved slightly in reply, and Smoke changed paws and tapped it again. The dog, however, did not rise to play as was his wont, and the cat fell to patting it briskly with both paws. Flame still lay motionless. This puzzled and bored the cat, and it went round and stared hard into its friend's face to see what was the matter. Perhaps some inarticulate message flashed from the dog's eyes into its little brain, making it understand that the program for the night had better not begin with play. Perhaps it only realized that its friend was immovable, but whatever the reason, its usual persistence thenceforth deserted it, and it made no further attempts at persuasion. Smoke yielded at once to the dog's mood, its head down where it was, and began to wash. But the washing, the doctor noted, was by no means its real purpose. It had only used it to mask something else. It stopped at the most busy and furious moments and began to stare about the room. Its thoughts wandered absurdly. It peered intently at the curtains, at the shadowy corners, at empty space above, leaving its body in curiously awkward positions for whole minutes together. Then it turned sharply and stared with a sudden signal of intelligence at the dog, and Flame at once rose somewhat stiffly to his feet, began to wander aimlessly and restlessly to and fro about the floor. Smoke followed him, patting quietly at his heels. Between them they made what seemed to be a deliberate search of the room. And here, as he watched them, noting carefully every detail of the performance over the top of his book, yet making no effort to interfere, it seemed to the doctor that the first beginnings of a faint distress betrayed themselves in the collie and in the cat the stirrings of a vague excitement. He observed them closely. The fog was thick in the air, and the tobacco smoke from his pipe added to its density. The furniture at the far end stood mistily, and where the shadows congregated in hanging clouds under the ceiling, it was difficult to see clearly at all. The lamplight only reached to a level of five feet from the floor, above which came layers of comparative darkness, so that the room appeared twice as lofty as it actually was. By means of the lamp and the fire, however, the carpet was everywhere clearly visible. The animals made their silent tour of the floor, sometimes the dog leading, sometimes the cat. Occasionally they looked at one another as though exchanging signals, and once or twice, in spite of the limited space, he lost sight of one or other among the fog and the shadows. Their curiosity appeared to him was something more than the excitement lurking in the unknown territory of a strange room, yet so far it was impossible to test this, and he purposely kept his mind quietly receptive, lest the smallest mental excitement on his part should communicate itself to the animals and thus destroy the value of their independent behavior. They made a very thorough journey, leaving no piece of furniture unexamined or unsmelt. Flame led the way, walking slowly with lowered head, and Smoke followed demurely at his heels, making a transparent pretense of not being interested, yet missing nothing, and at length they returned to the old collie first and came to rest on the mat before the fire. Flame rested his muzzle on his master's knee, smiling beatifically while he patted the yellow head and spoke his name, and smoke coming a little later, pretending he came by chance, looked from the empty saucer to his face, lapped up the milk when it was given him to the last drop, and then sprang upon his knee and curled round for the sleep it had fully earned and intended to enjoy. Silence descended upon the room. Only the breathing of the dog upon the mat came through the deep stillness, like the pulse of time marking the minutes, and the steady drip, drip, of the fog outside upon the window ledges, dismally testified to the inclemency of the night beyond, and the soft crashing of the coals, as the fire settled down into the grate, became less and less audible, as the fire sank and the flames resigned their fierceness. It was now well after eleven o'clock, and Dr. Silence devoted himself again to his book. He read the words on the printed page and took in their meaning superficially, yet without starting 
into life the correlations of thought and suggestion that should accompany interesting reading. Underneath all the while, as mental energies were absorbed in watching, listening, waiting for what might come, he was not over-sanguine himself, yet he did not wish to be taken by surprise. Moreover, the animals as sensitive barometers had incontinently gone to sleep. After reading a dozen pages, however, he realized that his mind was really occupied in reviewing the features of Pender's extraordinary story, and that it was no longer necessary to steady his imagination by studying the dull paragraphs detailed in the pages before him. He laid down his book accordingly and allowed his thoughts to dwell upon the features of the case. Speculations as to the meaning, however, he rigorously suppressed, knowing that such thoughts would act upon his imagination like wind upon the glowing embers of a fire. As the night wore on, the silence grew deeper and deeper, and only at rare intervals he heard the sound of wheels on the main road a hundred yards away, where the horses went at a walking pace owing to the density of the fog. The echo of pedestrian footsteps no longer reached him. The clamor of occasional voices no longer came down the side street. The night, muffled by fog shrouded by veils of ultimate mystery, hung about the haunted villa like a doom. Nothing in the house stirred, stillness in a thick blanket, lay over the upper stories, only the mist in the room grew more dense, he thought, and the damp cold more penetrating. Certainly from time to time he shivered. The collie, now deep in slumber, moved occasionally, grunted, sighed, or twitched his legs in dreams. Smoke lay on his knees, a pool of warm black fur, only the closest observation detecting the movement of his sleek sides. It was difficult to distinguish exactly where his head and body joined in that circle of glistening hair. Only a black satin nose and a tiny tip of pink tongue betrayed the secret. Dr. Silence watched him and felt comfortable. The collie's breathing was soothing. The fire was well built and would burn for another two hours without attention. He was not conscious of the least nervousness. His particular wish to remain in his ordinary normal state of mind and to force nothing. If sleep came naturally, he would let it come and even welcome it. The coldness of the room when the fire died down later would be sure to wake him again, and it would then be time enough to carry these sleeping barometers up to bed. From various psychic premonitions he knew quite well that the night would not pass without adventure, but he did not wish to force its arrival, and he wished to remain normal, and that the animals remain normal, so that when it came it would be unattended by excitement or by any straining of the attention. Many experiments had made him wise, and for the rest he had no fear. Accordingly, after a time he did not fall asleep as he had expected, and the last thing he remembered, before oblivion slipped up over his eyes like soft wool, was a picture of flame stretching all four legs at once, and sighing noisily as he sought a more comfortable position for his paws and muzzle upon the mat. It was a good deal later, when he became aware that a weight lay upon his chest, and that something was penciling over his face and mouth. A soft touch on the cheek woke him. Something was patting him. He sat up with a jerk and found himself staring straight into a pair of brilliant eyes, half green, half black. Smoke's face lay level with his own, and the cat had climbed up with its front paws upon his chest. The lamp had burned low, and the fire was nearly out, yet Dr. Silence saw in a moment that the cat was in an excited state. It kneaded with its front paws into his chest, shifting from one to the other. He felt them prodding against him. It lifted a leg very carefully and patted his cheek gingerly. Its furry saw was standing ridgewise upon its back. The ears were flattened back somewhat. The tail was twitching sharply. The cat, of course, had wakened him with a purpose, and the instant he realized this, he set it upon the arm of the chair and sprang up with a quick turn to face the empty room behind him. By some curious instinct, his arms of their own accord assumed an attitude of defense in front of him, as though to ward off something that threatened his safety. Yet nothing was visible, only shapes of fog hung about rather heavily in the air, moving slightly to and fro. His mind was now fully alert, and the last vestiges of sleep gone. He turned the lamp higher and peered about him. Two things he became aware of at once. That smoke, while excited, was pleasurably excited. The other, that the collie was no longer visible upon the mat at his feet. He had crept away to the corner of the wall furthest from the window, 
lay watching the room with wide-open eyes, in which lurked plainly something of alarm. Something in the dog's behavior instantly struck Dr. Silence as unusual, and calling him by name he moved across to pat him. Flame got up, wagged his tail, came over slowly to the rug, uttering a low sound that was half growl, half whine. He was evidently perturbed about something, and his master was proceeding to administer comfort when his attention was suddenly drawn to the antics of his other four-footed companion, the cat, and what he saw filled him with something like amazement. Smoke had jumped down from the back of the armchair and occupied the middle of the carpet, where, with tail erect and legs stiff as ramrods, it was steadily pacing backwards and forwards in a narrow space, uttering as it did so those curious little guttural sounds of pleasure that only an animal of the feline species knows how to express of supreme happiness. Its stiffened legs and arched back made it appear larger than usual, and the black visage wore a smile of beatific joy. Its eyes blazed magnificently. It was in an ecstasy. At the very end of every few paces it turned sharply and stalked back again along the same line, patting softly and purring like a roll of little muffled drums. It behaved precisely as though it were rubbing against the ankles of someone who remained invisible. A thrill ran down the doctor's spine as he stood and stared. His experiment was growing interesting at last. He called to call his attention to his friend's performance to see whether he too was aware of anything standing there upon the carpet, and the dog's behavior was significant and cooperative. He came as far as his master's knee and then stopped dead, refusing to investigate closely. In vain, Dr. Silence urged him. He wagged his tail, whined a little, and stood in a half-crouching attitude, staring alternately at the cat and at his master's face. He was apparently both puzzled and alarmed, and the whine went deeper and deeper down into his throat, till it changed into an ugly snarl of awakening anger. Then the doctor called to him in a tone of command he had never known to be disregarded, but still the dog, though springing up in response, declined to move nearer. He made tentative motions, pranced a little like a dog about to take to water, pretended to bark, and ran to and from the carpet. So far there was no actual fear in his manner, but he was uneasy and anxious, and nothing would induce him to go within touching distance of the walking cat. Once he made a complete circuit, but always careful out of reach, and the enemy returned to his master's legs and rubbed vigorously against him. Flame did not like the performance at all. That much was quite clear. For several minutes, John Silence watched the performance of the cat with profound attention and without interfering. Then he called to the animal by name. Smoke, you mysterious beastie. What in the world are you about? He said in a coaxing tone. The cat looked up at him for a moment, smiling in its ecstasy, blinking its eyes, but too happy to pause. He spoke to it again. He called to it several times, and each time it turned upon him its blazing eyes, drunk with inner delight opening and shutting its lips, its body large and rigid with excitement, yet it never for one instant paused in its short journeys to and fro. He noted exactly what it did. It walked. He saw the same number of paces each time, some six or seven steps, then it turned sharply and retraced them. By the pattern of the great roses in the carpet he measured, it kept to the same direction and the same line. It behaved precisely as though it were rubbing against something solid, Undoubtedly, there was something standing there on that strip of carpet, something invisible to the doctor, something that alarmed the dog, yet caused the cat unspeakable pleasure. Smokey, he called again. Smokey, you black mystery, what is it excites you so? Again, the cat looked up at him for a brief second, and then continued its sentry walk, blissfully happy, intensely preoccupied, and for an instant, as he watched it, the doctor was aware that a faint uneasiness stirred in the depths of his own being focusing itself for the moment upon this curious behavior of the uncanny creature before him. There arose in him quite a new realization of the mystery connected with the whole feline tribe, but especially with that common member of it, the domestic cat. Their hidden lives, their strange aloofness, their incalculable subtlety, how utterly remote from anything that human beings understood, lay the source of their elusive activities. As he watched the indescribable bearing of the little creature mincing along the strip of carpet under his eyes, coquetting with the powers of darkness, welcoming maybe some fearsome visitor, this stirred in his heart a feeling strangely akin to awe. Its indifference to humankind, its serene superiority to the obvious, struck him forcibly with fresh meaning. So remote, so inaccessible it seemed the secret purposes of its real life, 
so alien to the blundering honesty of other animals. It's an absolute poise of bearing brought into his mind, the opium eater's words that no dignity is perfect, which does not at some point ally itself with the mysterious. And he became suddenly aware that the presence of the dog in this foggy haunted room on the top of Putney Hill was uncommonly welcome to him. He was glad to feel that Flame's dependable personality was with him. The savage growling at his heels was a pleasant sound. He was glad to hear it. That marching cat made him uneasy. Finding that Smoke paid no further attention to his words, the doctor decided upon action. Would it rub against his leg, too? He would take it by surprise and see. He stepped quickly forward and placed himself upon the exact strip of carpet where it walked. But no cat has ever taken by surprise. The moment he occupied the space of the intruder, setting his feet on the woven roses midway in the line of travel, Smoke suddenly stopped purring and sat down. It lifted up its face with the utmost innocent stare imaginable of its green eyes. He could have sworn it laughed. It was a perfect child again. In a single second it resumed its simple domestic manner, and it gazed at him in such a way that he almost felt Smoke was the normal being, and his was the eccentric behavior that was being watched. It was consummate the manner in which it brought about this change, so easily and so quickly. Superb little actor, he laughed, in spite of himself, and stooped to stroke the shining black back. But in a flash, as he touched its furs, the cat turned and spat at him viciously, striking at his hand with one paw. Then, with a hurried scutter of feet, it shot like a shadow across the floor, and a moment later was calmly sitting over by the window curtain, washing its face as though nothing interested it in the whole world but the cleanness of its cheeks and whiskers. John Silence straightened himself up and drew a long breath. He realized that the performance was temporarily at an end. The collie, meanwhile, who had watched the whole proceeding with marked disapproval, had now lain down upon the mat by the fire, no longer growling. It seemed to the doctor just as though something that had entered the room while he slept, alarming the dog yet bringing happiness to the cat, had now gone out again, leaving all as it was before. Whatever it was that excited its blissful attention had retreated for the moment. He realized this intuitively. Smoke evidently realized it too, for presently he deigned to march back to the fireplace and jump upon his master's knees. Dr. Silence, patient and determined, settled down once more to his book. The animal soon slept, the fire blazed cheerfully, and the cold fog from outside poured into the room through every available chink and cranny. For a long time, silence and peace reigned in the room, and Dr. Silence availed himself of the quietness to make careful notes of what had happened. He entered for future use in other cases an exhaustive analysis of what he had observed, especially with regard to the effect upon the two animals. It is impossible here, nor would it be intelligible to the reader, unversed in the knowledge of the region, known to a scientifically trained psychic like Dr. Silence, to detail his observations but to him it was clear, up to a certain point, and for the rest he must still wait and watch. So far, at least, he realized that while he slept in the chair, that is, while his will was dormant, the room had suffered intrusion from what he recognized as an intensely active force and might later be forced to acknowledge as something more than merely a blind force, namely a distinct personality. So far it affected himself scarcely at all, but he had acted directly upon the simpler organisms of the animals. It stimulated keenly the centers of the cat's psychic being, inducing a state of instant happiness, intensifying its consciousness probably, in the same way a drug or stimulant intensifies that of a human being, whereas it alarmed the less sensitive dog, causing it to feel a vague apprehension and distress. His own sudden action and exhibition of energy had served to disperse it temporarily, yet he felt convinced the indications were not lacking even while he sat there making notes that it still remained near to him conditionally if not spatially and was as it were gathering force for a second attack and further he intuitively understood that the relations between the two animals had undergone a subtle change that the cat had become immeasurably superior confident sure of itself in its own peculiar region whereas Flame had been weakened by an attack he could not comprehend, and knew not how to reply to. Though not yet afraid, he was defiant, ready to act against the fear that he felt to be approaching. He was no longer fatherly and protective towards the cat. Smoke held the key to the situation. 
and both he and the cat knew it. Thus, as the minutes passed, John Silence sat and waited, keenly on the alert, wondering how soon the attack would be renewed, and at what point it would be diverted from the animals and directed upon himself. The book lay on the floor beside him. His notes were complete, with one hand on the cat's fur and the dog's front paws resting against his feet. The three of them dozed comfortably before the hot fire, while the night wore on and silence deepened towards midnight. It was well after one o'clock in the morning when Dr. Silence turned the lamp out and lighted the candle preparatory to going up to bed. Then Smoke suddenly woke with a loud sharp purr and sat up. It neither stretched, washed, nor turned. It listened, and the doctor watching it realized that a certain indefinable change had come about that very moment in the room. A swift readjustment of the forces within the four walls had taken place. A new disposition of their personal equations. The balance was destroyed, the former harmony gone. Smoke, most sensitive of barometers, had been the first to feel it, but the dog was not slow to follow suit. From looking down he noted that Flame was no longer asleep. He was lying with eyes wide open, and that same instant he sat up, his great haunches, and began to growl. Dr. Silence was in the act of taking the matches to relight the lamp, when an audible movement in the room behind him made him pause. Smoke leaped down from his knee and moved forward a few paces across the carpet. Then it stopped and stared fixedly, and the doctor stood up on the rug to watch. As he rose, the sound was repeated, and he discovered that it was not in the room as he first thought, but outside, and that it came from more directions than one. There was a rushing, sweeping noise against the window panes, and simultaneously a sound of something brushing against the door. Out in the hall, smoke advanced sedately across the carpet, twitching its tail, and sat down within a foot of the door. The influence that had destroyed the harmonious conditions of the room had apparently moved in advance of its cause. Clearly something was about to happen. For the first time that night, John Silence hesitated. The thought of that dark, narrow hallway, choked with fog and destitute of human comfort, was unpleasant. He became aware of a faint creeping of his flesh. He knew, of course, that the actual opening of the door was not necessary to the invasion of the room that was about to take place, since neither doors nor windows or any other solid barriers could interpose an obstacle to what was seeking entrance. Yet the opening of the door would be significant and symbolic, and he distinctly shrank from it. But for a moment only, smoke turning with a show of impatience, we called him to his purpose and he moved past the sitting, watching creature and deliberately opened the door to its full width. What subsequently happened happened in the feeble and flickering light of the solitary candle on the mantelpiece. Through the open door he saw the hall dimly, lit and thick with fog. Nothing, of course, was visible, nothing but the hat stand, the African spears and dark lines upon the wall, and the high-backed wooden chair, standing grotesquely underneath on the oilcloth floor. For one instant the fog seemed to move and thicken oddly, but he set that down to the score of the imagination. The door had opened upon nothing, yet Smoke apparently thought otherwise, and the deep growling of the collie from the mat on the back of the room seemed to confirm his judgment. For, proud and self-possessed, the cat had again risen to his feet, and having advanced to the door was now ushering someone slowly into the room. Nothing could have been more evident. He paced from side to side, bowing his little head with great impressment and holding his stiffened tail aloft like a flagstaff. He turned this way and that, mincing to and fro and showing signs of supreme satisfaction. He was in his element. He welcomed the intrusion and apparently reckoned that his companions, the doctor and the dog, would welcome it likewise. The intruder had returned for a second attack. Dr. Silence moved slowly backwards and took up his position on the hearth rug, keying himself up to a condition of concentrated attention. He noted that Flame stood beside him, facing the room with body motionless and head moving swiftly from side to side, with a curious swaying movement. His eyes were wide open, his back rigid, his neck and jaws thrust forward, his legs tense and ready to leap, savage, ready for attack or defense, yet dreadfully puzzled and perhaps already a little cowed. He stood and stared, the hair on his spine and sides positively bristling outwards as though a wind played through them. In the dim firelight, he looked like a great yellow-haired wolf, silent eyes, shooting dark fire, exceedingly formidable. It was flame, the terrible. Smoke, meanwhile, 
advanced from the door towards the middle of the room, adopting the very slow pace of an invisible companion. A few feet away it stopped and began to smile and blink its eyes. There was something deliberately coaxing in its attitude as it stood there, undecided on the carpet, clearly wishing to effect some sort of introduction between the intruder and its canine friend and ally. It assumed its almost winning manners, purring, smiling, looking persuasively from one to the other, and making quick, tentative steps first in one direction and then in the other. There had always existed such perfect understanding between them and everything. Surely Flame would appreciate Smoke's intentions now, and agree. But the old collie made no advances. He bared his teeth, lifting his lips till the gums showed, and stood stock still with fixed eyes and heaving sides. The doctor moved a little further back, watching intently the smallest movement, and it was just then he divined suddenly from the cat's behavior and attitude that it was not only a single companion it had ushered into the room, but several. It kept crossing from one to another, looking up at each in turn. It sought to win over the dog to friendliness with them all. The original intruder had come back with reinforcements, and at the same time he further realized that the intruder was something more than a blindly acting force, impersonal though destructive. It was a personality, and moreover, a great personality, and it was accompanied for the purposes of assistance by a host of other personalities, minor in degree, but similar in kind. He braced himself in the corner against the mantelpiece and waited, his whole being roused to defense, for he was now fully aware that the attack had spread to include himself as well as the animals, and he must be on the alert. He strained his eyes through the foggy atmosphere, trying in vain to see what the cat and dog saw but the candlelight threw an uncertain and flickering light across the room, and his eyes discerned nothing. On the floor smoke moved softly in front of him like a black shadow, his eyes gleaming as he turned his head, still trying with many insinuating gestures and much purring to bring about the introductions he desired. But it was all in vain. Flame stood riveted to one spot, motionless as a figure carved in stone. Some minutes passed during which only the cat moved, and then there came a sharp change. Flame began to back towards the wall. He moved his head from side to side as he went, something turning to snap at something almost behind him. They were advancing upon him, trying to surround him. His distress became very marked from now onward, and it seemed to the doctor that his anger merged into genuine terror and became overwhelmed by it. The savage growl sounded personally like a whine, and more than once he tried to dive past his master's legs as though hunting for a way of escape. He was trying to avoid something that everywhere blocked away. This terror of the indomitable fighter impressed the doctor enormously, yet also painfully stirring his impatience, for he had never before seen the dog show signs of giving in, and it distressed him to witness it. He knew, however, that he was not giving in easily, and understood that it was really impossible for him to gauge the animal's sensations properly at all. What Flame felt and saw must be terrible indeed, to turn him all at once into a coward. He faced something that made him afraid of more than his life merely. The doctor spoke a few quick words of encouragement to him and stroked a bristling hair, but without much success. The collie seemed already beyond the reach of comfort, such as that, and the collapse of the old dog followed indeed very speedily after this. And Smoke, meanwhile, remained behind, watching the advance, but not joining in it, sitting pleased and expectant, considering that all was going well and as it wished, it was kneading on the carpet with its front paws, slowly laboriously as though its feet were dipped in triacle. The sound its claws made as they caught in the threads was distinctly audible. It was still smiling, blinking, purring. Suddenly the collar uttered a poignant short bark and leaped heavily to one side. His bared teeth traced a line of whiteness through the gloom. The next instant he dashed past his master's legs, almost upsetting his balance and shot out into the room, where he went blundering wildly against the walls and furniture. But that bark was significant. The doctor had heard it before and knew what it meant, for it was the cry of the fighter against the odds, and it meant that the old beast had found its courage again. Possibly it was only the courage of despair, but at any rate the fighting would be terrific, and Dr. Science understood, too, that he dared not interfere. Flame must fight his own enemies in his own way. But the cat, too, had heard that dreadful bark, and it, too, had understood. This was more than it had bargained for. Across the dim shadows of that haunted room, there must have passed some secret signal of distress between the animals. Smoke stood up and looked swiftly about him. He uttered a piteous meow and trotted smartly away into the greater darkness by the windows. 
What his object was only those endowed with a spirit-like intelligence of cats might know. But at any rate he had at last ranged himself on the side of his friend, and the little beast meant business. At the same moment the collie managed to gain the door. The doctor saw him rush through the hall like a flash of yellow light. He shot across the oilcloth and tore up the stairs. But in another second he appeared again, flying down the steps and landing at the bottom in a tumbling heap, whining, cringing, terrified. The doctor saw him slink back into the room again and crawl round by the wall, towards the cat. Was then even the staircase occupied? Did they stand also in the hall? Was the whole house crowded from floor to ceiling? The thought came to add to the keen distress he felt at the sight of the collie's discomfiture, and indeed his own personal distress had increased in a marked degree during the past minutes, and continued to increase steadily to the climax. He recognized that the drain on his own vitality grew steadily, and that the attack was now directed against himself even more than against the defeated dog and the too-much-deceived cat. It all seemed so rapid and uncalculated after that. The events that took place in this little modern room at the top of Putney Hill, between midnight and sunrise, that Dr. Silence was hardly able to follow and remember it all. It came about with such uncanny swiftness and terror. The light was so uncertain, the movements of the black cat so difficult to follow on the dark carpet, and the doctor himself so weary and taken by surprise that he found it almost impossible to observe accurately or to recall afterwards precisely what it was he had seen or in what order the incidents had taken place. He never could understand what defective visions on his part made it seem as though the cat had duplicated itself at first and then increased indefinitely so that there were at least a dozen of them darting silently about the floor, leaping softly onto chairs and tables, passing like shadows from the open door to the end of the room, all black as sin with brilliant green eyes, flashing fire in all directions. It was like the reflections from a score of mirrors placed around the walls at different angles. Nor could he make out the time why the size of the room seemed to have altered, grown much larger, and why it extended away behind him where ordinarily the walls would have been. The snarling of the enraged and terrified collie sounded sometimes so far away. The ceiling seemed to have raised itself so much higher than before, and much of the furniture had changed its appearance and shifted marvelously. It was also confused and confusing, as though the little room he knew had become merged and transformed into the dimensions of quite another chamber that came to him with its host of cats and its strange distances in a sort of vision. But these changes came about a little later and at a time when his attention was so concentrated upon the proceedings of smoke in the collie that he only observed them as it were subconsciously. In the excitement, the flickering candlelight, the distress he felt for the collie, and the distorting atmosphere of fog were the poorest possible allies to careful observation. At first, he was only aware that the dog was repeating his short, dangerous bark from time to time, snapping viciously at the empty air a foot or so from the ground. Once, indeed, he sprang upwards and forwards, working furiously with teeth and paws, with a noise like wolves fighting, but only to dash back the next minute against the wall behind him. Then, after lying still for a bit, he rose to a crouching position, as though to spring again, snarling horribly and making short half-circles with lowered head, and smoke all the while, meowed piteously by the window as though trying to draw the attack upon himself. Then it was that the rush of the whole dreadful business seemed to turn aside from the dog and direct itself upon his own person. The collie had made another spring and fallen back with a crash into the corner, where he made noise enough in his savage rage to waken the dead before he fell to whining, and then finally lay still. And directly afterward the doctor's own distress became intolerably acute. He had made a half-movement forward to come to the rescue, when a veil that was denser than a mere fog seemed to drop down over the scene, draping rooms, walls, animals, and fire, in a mist of darkness enfolding also about its own mind. Other forms moved silently across the field of vision, forms that he recognized from previous experiments and welcomed not. Unholy thoughts began to crowd into his brain. Sinister suggestions of evil presented themselves seductively. I seemed to settle about his heart, and his mind trembled. He began to lose memory. Memory of his identity, of where he was, of what he thought to do. The very foundation of his strength was shaken. His will seemed paralyzed. And it was then that the room filled with this horde of cats, all dark as the night, all silent, all with lamping eyes of green fire, 
the dimensions of the place altered and he shifted. He was in a much larger space. The whining of the dog found him far away, and all about him the cats flew busily to and fro, silently playing their tearing, rushing game of evil, weaving the pattern of their dark purpose upon the floor. He strove hard to collect himself and remember the words of power he had made use of before, in similar dread positions, where his dangerous practice had sometimes led. But he could recall nothing consecutively. A mist lay over his mind and memory. He felt dazed and his forces scattered. The deeps within were too troubled for healing power to come out of them. It was glamour, of course. He realized as afterwards, the strong glamour thrown upon his imagination by some powerful personality behind the veil. But at the time he was not sufficiently aware of this, and as with all true glamour was unable to grasp where the true ended and the faults began. He was caught momentarily in the same vortex that sought to lure the cat to destruction through its delight and threatened utterly to overwhelm the dog through its terror. There came a sound in the chimney behind him, like wind booming and tearing its way down. The windows rattled, the candle flickered and went out, the glacial atmosphere closed around him with the cold of death, and a great rushing sound swept by overhead, as though the ceiling had lifted to a great height. He heard the door shut. Far away it sounded. He felt lost, shelterless in the depths of his soul. Yet still he held out and resisted while the climax of the fight came nearer and nearer. He had stepped into the stream of forces awakened by Pender, and he knew that he must withstand them to the end or come to a conclusion that it was not good for a man to come to. Something from that region of utter cold was upon him. And then quite suddenly, through the confused mist about him, there slowly rose up the personality that had been all the time directing the battle. Some force entered his being that shook him as a tempest shakes a leaf, and closed against his eyes. Clean level with his face, he found himself staring into the wreck of a vast dark countenance, a countenance that was terrible even in its ruin. For ruined it was, and terrible it was, and the mark of spiritual evil was branded everywhere upon its broken features. Eyes, face, and hair rose level with his own and for a space of time he never could properly measure or determine. These two, a man and a woman, looked straight into each other's visages and down into each other's hearts. And, John Silence, the soul with a good, unselfish motive, held his own against the dark, discarnate woman, whose motive was pure evil and whose soul was on the side of the dark powers. It was the climax that touched the depth of power within him and began to restore him slowly to his own. He was conscious, of course, of effort, and yet it seemed no superhuman one, for he had recognized the character of his opponent's power, and he called upon the good within him to meet and overcome it. The inner forces stirred and trembled in response to his call. They did not at first come readily, as he was their habit, for under the spell of glamour they had already been diabolically lulled into inactivity, but come they eventually did. Rising out of the inner spiritual nature he had learned with so much time and pain to awaken to life, and power and confidence came with them. He began to breathe deeply and regularly, and at the same time to absorb into himself the forces opposed to him, and to turn them into his own account. By ceasing to resist and allowing the deadly stream to pour into him unopposed, he used the very power supplied by his adversary and thus enormously increased his own. For the spiritual alchemy he had learned, he understood that force ultimately is everywhere one and the same. It is the motive behind that makes it good or evil, and his motive was entirely unselfish. He knew, provided he was not first robbed of self-control, how vicariously to absorb these evil radiations into himself and change them magically into his own good purposes. And since his motive was pure and his soul fearless, they could not work in him harm. Thus he stood in the mainstream of evil unwittingly attracted by Pender, deflecting its course upon himself, and after passing through the purifying filter of his own unselfishness, these energies could only add to a store of experience, of knowledge, and therefore of power, and as his self-control returned to him, he gradually accomplished his purpose, even though trembling while he did so. Yet the struggle was severe, and in spite of the freezing chill of the air, the perspiration poured down his face, then by slow degrees the dark and dreadful countenance faded, the glamour passed from his soul, the normal proportions returned to walls and ceiling, the forms melted back into the fog and the whirl of rushing shadow-cats disappeared whence they came, and with the return 
of the consciousness of his own identity, John's silence was restored to the full control of his own willpower. In a deep modulated voice he began to utter certain rhythmical sounds that slowly rolled through the air like a rising sea, filling the room with powerful vibratory activities that whelmed all irregularities of lesser vibrations in its own swelling tone. He made certain sigils, gestures and movements at the same time. For several minutes he continued to utter these words until at length the growing volume dominated the whole room and mastered the manifestation of all that opposed it. For just as he understood the spiritual alchemy that can transmute evil forces by raising them into higher channels, so he knew from long study the occult use of sound and its direct effect upon the plastic region wherein the powers of spiritual evil work their fell purposes. Harmony was restored first of all to his own soul, and thence to the room and all its occupants. And after himself, the first to recognize it was the old dog lying in his corner. Flame began suddenly uttering sounds of pleasure, that something between a growl and a grunt that dogs make upon being restored to their master's confidence. Dr. Silence heard the thumping of the collie's tail against the ground, and the grunt and the thumping touched the depth of affection in the man's heart, and gave him some inkling of what agonies a dumb creature had suffered. Next, from the shadows by the window, a somewhat shrill purring announced the restoration of the cat to its normal state. Smoke was advancing across the carpet. He seemed very pleased with himself and smiled with an expression of supreme innocence. He was no shadow cat, but real and full of his usual and perfect self-possession. He marched along, picking his way delicately, but with a stately dignity that suggested his ancestry with the majesty of Egypt. His eyes no longer glared. They shone steadily before him. They radiated not excitement, but knowledge. Clearly he was anxious to make amends for the mischief to which he had unwittingly lent himself, owing to his subtle and electric constitution. Still uttering his sharp, high purring, he marched up to his master and rubbed vigorously against his legs. Then he stood on his hind feet, and pawed his knees and stared beseechingly up into his face. He turned his head towards the corner where the collie still lay, thumping his tail feebly and pathetically. John Silence understood. He bent down and stroked a creature's living fur, noting the line of bright blue sparks that followed the motion of his hand down its back, and then they advanced together towards the corner where the dog was. Smoke went first and put his nose gently against his friend's muzzle purring while he rubbed an utterly little soft sounds of affection in his throat. The doctor lit the candle and brought it over. He saw the collie lying on its side against the wall. It was utterly exhausted, and foam still hung about its jaws. Its tails and eyes responded to the sound of its name, but it was evidently very weak and overcome. Smoke continued to rub against his cheek and nose and eyes, sometimes even standing on its body and kneading it in the thick yellow hair. Flame replied from time to time by little licks of the tongue, most of them curiously misdirected. But Dr. Silence felt intuitively that something disastrous had happened, and his heart was wrung. He stroked the dear body, feeling it over for bruises or broken bones, but finding none. He fed it with what remained of the sandwiches and milk, but the creature clumsily upset the saucer and lost the sandwiches between its paws, so that the doctor had to feed it with his own hand, and all the while smoke meowed piteously. Then John Sands began to understand. He went across to the further side of the room and called aloud to it. Flame, old man, come. At any other time the dog would have been upon him in an instant, barking and leaping to the shoulder. And even now he got up, though heavily and awkwardly, to his feet. He started to run, wagging his tail more briskly. He collided first with a chair and then ran straight into a table. Smoke trotted close to his side, trying his very best to guide him, but it was useless. Dr. Silence had to lift him up into his own arms and carry him like a baby, for he was blind. Part 3 It was a week later when John Silence called to see the author in his new house, and found him well on the way to recovery and already busy again with his writing. The haunted look had left his eyes, and he seemed cheerful and confident. Humor restored, laughed the doctor as soon as they were comfortably settled in the room overlooking the park. I've had no trouble since I left that dreadful place, returned Pender gratefully, and thanks to you. The doctor stopped him with a gesture. "'Never mind that,' he said. "'We'll discuss your new plans afterwards. And my scheme for relieving you of the house and helping you settle elsewhere, of course, it must be pulled down, for it's not fit for any sensitive person to live in, and any other tenant might be afflicted in the same way you were, although personally I think the evil has exhausted itself by now.' He told the astonished author something of his experience in it with the animals. 
I don't pretend to understand, Pender said, when the account was finished, but I and my wife are intensely relieved to be free of it all. Only I must say I should like to know something of the former history of the house. When we took it six months ago, I heard no word against it. Dr. Silence drew a typewritten paper from his pocket. I can satisfy your curiosity to some extent, he said, running his eye over the sheets and then replacing them to his coat, for by my secretary's investigation I have been able to check certain information obtained in the hypnotic trance by a sensitive who helps me in such cases. The former occupant who haunted you appears to have been a woman of singularly atrocious life and character who finally suffered death by hanging after a series of crimes that appalled the whole of England and only came to light by the merest chance. She came to her in the year 1798, for it was not this particular house she lived in, but a much larger one that then stood upon the site it now occupies, and was then, of course, not in London, but in the country. She was a person of intellect, possessed of a powerful, trained will, and of consummate audacity, and I am convinced availed herself of the resources of the lower magic to attain her ends. It goes far in to explain the virulence of the attack upon yourself, and why she is still able to carry on after death the evil practices that formed her main purpose during life. You think that after death a soul can still consciously direct? gasped the author. I think, as I told you before, that the forces of a powerful personality may still persist after death in the line of their original momentum, replied the doctor, and as strong thoughts and purposes can still react upon suitably prepared brains long after their originators have passed away. If you knew anything of magic, he pursued, you would know that thought is dynamic and that it may call into existence forms and pictures that may well exist for hundreds of years, for not far removed from that region of our human life is another region where floats the waste and drift of all the centuries, the limbo of the shells of the dead, a densely populated region crammed with horror and abomination of all descriptions and sometimes galvanized into active life again by the will of a trained manipulator, a mind versed in the practices of lower magic. That this woman understood its vile commerce, I am persuaded, and the forces she set going during her life have simply been accumulating ever since, and would have continued to do so had they not been drawn down upon yourself, and afterward discharged and satisfied through me. Anything might have brought down the attack, for besides drugs there are certain violent emotions, certain moods of the soul, certain spiritual fevers, if I may so call them, which directly open the inner being to a cognizance of this astral region I have mentioned. In your case it happened to be a peculiarly potent drug that did it. But now tell me, he added, after a pause, adding to the perplexed author a pencil drawing he had made of the dark countenance that appeared to him during the night on Putney Hill. Tell me if you recognize this face. Pender looked at the drawing closely. Greatly astonished, he shuddered a little as he looked. Undoubtedly, he said, it is the face I kept trying to draw. Dark, with a great mouth and jaw, and a drooping eye. That is the woman. Dr. Sonson produced from his pocket book an old-fashioned woodcut of the same person, which his secretary had unearthed from the records of the Newgate calendar. The woodcut and the pencil drawing were two different aspects of the same dreadful visage. The men compared them for some moments in silence. It makes me thank God for the limitations of our senses, said Pender quietly with a sigh. Continuous clairvoyance must be a sore affliction. It is indeed, returned John Sion significantly. And if all the people nowadays who claim to be clairvoyant were really so, the statistics of suicide and lunacy would be considerably higher than they are. It is little wonder, he added, that your sense of humor was clouded with the mind forces of that dead monster trying to use your brain for the dissemination. You have an interesting adventure, Mr. Felix Pender, and let me add, a fortunate escape. The author was about to renew his thanks when there came a sound of scratching at the door, and the doctor sprang up quickly. It's time for me to go. I left my dog on the step, but I suppose. Before he had time to open the door, it had yielded to the pressure behind it and flew wide open to admit a great yellowed hair collie. The dog, wagging his tail and contorting his whole body with delight, tore across the floor and tried to leap upon his owner's breast, and there was laughter and happiness in the old eyes, for they were clear again as the day.